And welcome to the European Parliament in Brussels for this new edition of Talking Europe. Is Turkey rediscovering its love affair with Europe? Turkish officials are seeking to revive their country's EU bid after a series of diplomatic setbacks have left the country increasingly isolated in Europe and the Middle East. But the Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan recently shocked Europe by cracking down on peaceful protesters as well as police and judges who tried to investigate high-level corruption. So is Turkey Eurocompatible? Will this large nation of 72 million people ever join the European Union? I will put the question to my guest who will join me. In a moment, and in the second part of the program, I'll be joined by Emily O'Reilly. She is the European Ombudsman. She'll tell us more about her role as the EU's top mediator. But let's start on our set here at the European Parliament. Turkey was recognized as a candidate country in 1999. Accession negotiations started in 2005. Progress has been very slow. On and off talks, uh, by the way, talks resumed in November after being suspended for nearly three and a half years. I'm glad to be joined on this set by Selim Yenel. Welcome to uh, Talking Europe. You're the uh, Turkish ambassador to the European Union. Glad also with us, Marietje Schake, Dutch MEP from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. Uh, you wrote uh, a lot on, on Turkey. It'll be interesting to hear your point of view and the view from Ankara, from Turkey as well. Uh, now, Ambassador, I remember uh, interviewing uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, a couple of years ago. He was very confident. He told me, look, we are a new local superpower. Um, Europe needs us more than we actually need Europe. What's the feeling today in Turkey regarding the European Union? Well, I think he was at that time trying to give a message to the Union because at that time, uh, when he made that statement, <coughs> the Union was keeping its distance from Turkey. And I think at this juncture, we both need each other very much. And that's why you're seeing that the Prime Minister is here just the other day. And uh, he has acknowledged and said First that... First visit in five years. In five years, unfortunately. As a candidate, we should see each other much more often. But just to come back to what the Prime Minister has said uh, just recently, that we want 2014 to be an EU year. What is the feeling here at the European Parliament of Law? Of course, there's been a, a lot of criticism following uh, uh, what is perceived as uh, Turkey cracking down on police, on judges uh, who try to investigate high-level corruption. What's the feeling in Brussels? Well, we're very concerned about what I would call a state crisis in Turkey. And I'm, I'm you know, surprised, but sort of happily surprised to hear the ambassador say that Turkey also needs Europe, because not long ago, when we criticized the harsh crack crackdown by police on peaceful demonstrators in Turkey last summer, uh, the prime minister said, oh, you know, the European Parliament is an institution that I don't authorize, I don't recognize to be legitimate. Uh, the criticism of our concern with the lack of a separation of powers, a lack of an independent judiciary, uh, really the problems that are now precisely surfacing in this state crisis in Turkey have been, been dismissed as conspiracies by the Prime Minister over and over, have not been taken as seriously as they should be. So all I can hope is that this momentum of intense crisis in Turkey, a deep polarization uh, that has surfaced after years of brutal below the surface uh, will now be met with serious engagement and you know the EU is happy to uh, to continue to talk about how to restore the rule of law in Turkey which is clearly not in place right now uh, but it will require a prime minister and a government to take European concerns seriously that's the only way forward is the Turkish government taking these concerns seriously and are Mr. Erdogan's policies euro compatible well, I mean, when the Prime Minister was here, he spoke with not only the Council and Commission Presidents, he went to the European Parliament, this building, and he addressed uh, the, the Conference of Presidents, uh, and he talked to them very openly about everything. And in fact, uh, if you now remember, uh, the draft law on the High uh, Council of uh, Prosecutors and Judges has been scrapped so far, and we have taken the EU's uh, views very seriously. So the EU is, uh, has always been our benchmark, uh, it's the anchor, and we have said so very openly. Uh, I think we need each other. But for a long time, the EU uh, had a, you know, an attitude that was a bit too far away from us. And I think we're now rediscovering each other, which is a good thing. 
uh, we need EU, but the EU had gone inwards because of the, EU cri uh, the Euro crisis, the economic crisis. And I think that the recovery of uh, the EU will now open, the, open it up for enlargement as well. This is our hope. And as you know, the French president uh, visited Turkey this week. It was the first visit, uh, first state visit by a French president uh, since 1992. Let's watch our report. Finally receiving his French counterpart, François Hollande, Turkish President Abdullah Gül had one topic in particular burning his lips support for Turkish membership to the European Union. We are expecting France to have a positive approach to this subject, to help us and above all not bring political deadlock upon us as we pursue these negotiations. This is what we are calling for once again. Ankara began negotiations to join in 2005, 18 years after applying. But a string of political hurdles, including resistance from Germany and France, have slowed progress. Paris and Ankara's relationship has also suffered in recent years. A French law making it illegal to deny the killing of Armenians by Ottoman Turks was genocide, caused huge controversy. Armenians protested in Paris ahead of the visit. In response to Gull's plea, Hollande offered cautious backing, saying Turkey's EU membership would be put before the French people. As far as France is concerned, the only way to discuss membership when the time comes will be with a referendum. We are not the only country to impose this condition, but that shouldn't prevent us from continuing the discussion, the negotiations, chapter by chapter. All but 13 chapters are blocked by France, Cyprus, the island state which Turkey doesn't recognize, and the European Commission. It says Turkey doesn't yet meet essential standards on human rights and freedom of speech and religion. But it's not an imminent concern for Hollande. The EU has ruled out any membership for Ankara before 2020, after his first term in office ends. So as we heard, uh, President Hollande offered a cautious backing. He says, I will support Turkey's EU bid, providing Turkey doesn't uh, backtrack on democratic reforms. He also said that ultimately there would be a referendum in France. And that's very important because the French will have a final say. There might be other referendums in, in other EU countries and in Turkey, of course. That's providing Turkey uh, joins the EU uh, one day. Now, when I look at the polls, a recent poll showed that 83% of the French say they don't want Turkey to join the European Union. Is it the case that you don't feel welcome anymore? Well, I mean, we've gone through so many different phases in our relationship with the EU. Of course, it's, uh, I mean, you take one poll one year, it changes. Uh, and I'm sure that by the time we reach a level of, let's say, uh, the same level of the EU in which we are now welcome, I think the, the public opinion will change. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, and we need leadership from major countries to say that Turkey is actually welcome. Uh, for a long time in France, Mr. Sarkozy said quite the opposite. And of course that hurt the population, uh, the, the views of the, of the people, both in Turkey and in France. Uh, this has to change. And I think that uh, President Hollande's visit is a welcome change in that respect. What about the Netherlands? What's the feeling in, that, in the Netherlands? Because overall in Europe, a majority of Europeans say they don't want to see Turkey within the European Union. Well, I think if we keep the interest of the population in Turkey in mind and also the potential benefits for economic growth and more security uh, in a very difficult region, there are benefits to be foreseen. But the popular support, both in Turkey and in Europe, would benefit so much if Turkey would actually stick to reforms in terms of um, guaranteeing press and media freedom, ensuring the rule of law is upheld and respected, making sure that human rights are not trampled upon. It is very difficult looking at myself, I'm a liberal, we've been uh, focusing on the potential benefits of Turkish accession despite all the political criticism uh, against uh, where Turkey was going. But it's so much more difficult to promote Turkish accession when journalists are imprisoned, when uh, there are now 
open wars between uh, people accusing each other of corruption on the one hand, of infiltrating the judiciary on the other hand. We see the currency collapsing. We see accusations by the prime minister towards the international media, the international financial markets. Where is this all going? Uh, I have to say, the, the crisis that we see now in the state of Turkey will probably get worse before it can get better. And I'm very, very concerned precisely because I believe that we have to continue to talk uh, and while we're, we're facing criticism from our populations for doing so. Ambassador, do you agree that the latest developments in Turkey uh, mean bad publicity for Turkey's EU bid? Well, I mean, uh, also remarking on what has been just said, uh, we have not been able to open two critical chapters, 23 and 24, which are directly related to the issues that you just mentioned. And it's just, you know, everybody's paying lip service to open these chapters, but nothing is happening. And that's what I said, we need more EU to, to help us in this res respect, uh, but the EU is just uh, not helping us in this, in this matter. Uh, I've been an, an advocate of opening chapters 23 and 24 yes. that deal with the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. But nothing stops Turkey to engage in reforming without these chapters as well. I mean, I agree we have to push for the mm -hmm. opening of these chapters, but by all means, may the government and all those who are taking responsibility uh, in Turkey please continue to reform with or without the EU in the, for the interest of the country, the rule of law uh, and the future of Turkey. Well, of course, primarily it's in the interest of our own country, definitely. Uh, but in the meantime, we had a positive agenda with the Commission. And that also included chapters 23 and 24. Yes. So below the surface, we are working together with the Commission, but it's not enough. We need also the political backing mm -hmm. of countries to do so. Um, yes, we're not out of the woods yet. We have some things to, that have to be corrected. But it would be better if we do it with a good partnership from the EU side, which we don't find it in all aspects yet. So what is the timeline? Because as I said, you've been a candidate. You've had candidate status since 1999. So far, Turkey and the European Union have only opened 14 chapters out of 35. It's going very slowly. Uh, will Turkey ever join the European Union? All I can say is I hope so. Uh, and it's up to the leadership in Turkey to take its responsibility and to first and foremost solve the state crisis that we're seeing right now. I cannot underline enough how worried I am of what we see. Uh, it is really a collapse of the state of Turkey with enormous consequences. And I, I do not see light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, before this crisis is solved, I have difficulty seeing where the next steps in the negotiations might go. Uh, as mentioned, I agree we should focus on the rule of law, which needs to be restored in Turkey. We must see fundamental rights and freedoms ensured in Turkey, whether it's of minorities, journalists, women, uh, or political minorities. There is so much work to be done. So. Uh, I hope we will see Turkey join the EU because the people in Turkey would be much better off uh, in a rule of law uh, with their rights and freedoms respected. I'm more optimistic and pessimistic on, on both. What do I mean by that? Optimistic in the sense that Turkey will come out of this crisis, the this, this situation that we're facing. We've done so in the past, we'll do so again. And look at Turkey from a point of view of 10 years ago, 15 years ago. What have we achieved? We'll achieve even more. It's not easy, but we'll do so. So I'm optimistic on our future. Pessimistic with regard to the EU. In what sense? Because we still have the Cyprus situation, which we haven't mentioned. Unless we resolve that problem, then we won't make any progress. But let's say that we do resolve it, which will be a small miracle, then we'll be facing some major countries that don't want us in the EU. And unfortunately, there are some countries that are very, very large that don't want us at the table. Ambassador, what is your message to those Europeans who say, Turkey is not Euro-compatible, partly also because it's a Muslim country and Europe is not ready to take in such a large country uh, on board. Well, that's a very simple answer. Uh, we're talking about a union uh, which is composed mostly of Christian countries of 500 million. Uh, what's 75 million in a 500 million? We're not afraid to join the union. We don't have such qualms. Why does the EU countries have it in that sense? It should act as a secular liberal democracy and, and then everything is, is fine. But unfortunate, the unfortunate reality is that perception in, in many countries is that they don't want uh, a Muslim population, which happens to be secular. We are just only happen to be Muslim. Uh, we don't have the Sharia. We have secular laws, legislation. We have the Aki. In the end, if we you know, harmonize our legislation with the Aki, then we'll have no difference with any EU country. Mm -hmm.
That's the message. We won't be any different except in our religion, which is a private matter. Okay, well, let's me bring in our partner, Tim King from uh, European Voice, publisher of a weekly newspaper on European news. Uh, Tim King, uh, welcome to uh, our program. Of course, European Voice provides independent insight into the Brussels Beltway and we'll look back at this week in Europe. It's been, I believe, a good week for television broadcasters. Well, I confess that this week I've let irony get the better of me. I think it's a good week for television broadcasters. The European Broadcasting Union has announced that um, there will be a televised debate between candidates for the presidency of the European Commission. Now, most people would know the European Broadcasting Union as the organisers of the Eurovision Song Contest, <laughs> if they know True. it at all. And, um, and in fact, some people are looking forward to the uh, next edition of on the 10th of May, I think it's being broadcast from uh, Copenhagen. Well, four days after that, to compete for entertainment value, the candidates for the presidency of the Commission will be debating. Now, the theory behind all this was that this contest for the presidency of the Commission was going to make elections for the European Parliament more interesting. And it will be a big test. Um, of Whether yeah, national TVs will broadcast this debate, will they take it seriously, will there be a lot of interest? That's will the anyone question. watch? Will anyone if, if you'll be watching. I'm sure won't. you will I'm be watching. I'm professionally obliged to watch, probably. But, but, but if they don't watch, what hope is there of people then ten days, two weeks later, going out to vote in the European Parliament elections. So it'll be a big test. A bad week for a, a certain... It's a, it's a bad week for Croatia. I mean, Croatia. Actually, it's been a, bit, been a difficult few months for Croatia since it, it joined the European Union in, in, in 1st of July, and, that, and now reality bites home. The finance ministers of the European Union sort of gave an official... Uh, reprimand ticking off they put it under special measures as it were it's what they call the excessive deficit procedure because croatia's public finances aren't in compliance with european union rules and that's what happens once you're inside the european union thank you very much to all of you uh, for taking part in this edition of talking europe now please stay with me i'll return just after the news break i'll bring you an interview with the european ombudsman emily o'reilly that's just after the news break